on this Tuesday night, reopening Europe's borders and restarting tourism. Canada makes the list of safe countries and the U.S. does not. I'm quite concerned about travel. We're cleared for takeoff, but should we go? Increasing alarm about how many people could die of COVID-19 in the U.S. It is going to be very disturbing, I will guarantee you that. And multiplying demands for a coherent strategy. Toronto's mission to make wearing face masks mandatory. And showcasing the scope of Canada's diversity. Nisaki. A sharp new rendition of our national anthem. Oh, Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. After months of enduring this pandemic, some people are dreaming of a vacation abroad. And today, the European Union, desperate to save its lucrative summer tourist season, is making a big push to reel us in. The EU has released a list of countries it considers safe, and Canada is one of 14 countries that made the cut. The United States did not. Airlines are also getting anxious to get more people on board. They're relaxing physical distancing policies and planning to fly full flights. Canadian public health experts, though, are sending a different message. They say just because you can doesn't mean you should. And even if you do fly abroad, you must self-isolate for 14 days when you come home. Airlines are facing accusations of putting profit ahead of public health, and Canadians are caught in the middle, trying to figure out what's really safe this summer. Our coverage begins with Crystal Gamancing and the EU's attempt to save its tourism season. After months of sitting empty, Terminal 3 at the main international airport in Rome is expected to spring back to life. This week, says the airport director general, we had an average of about 13,000 passengers per day. Usually we would have 150,000 passengers per day. We are expecting further increases with the gradual reopenings. Starting July 1st, foreign tourists from more than a dozen countries, including Canada, are being welcomed back to Europe. Spain will adopt the European recommendation, says the government's spokesperson, which will allow the entrance of travellers from third countries. The pandemic had a stranglehold on Europe cutting off the tourism sector, which generates 400 billion euros, or more than 610 billion Canadian annually. Health experts, however, worry the invite could lead to a surge in cases. I'm quite concerned about travel, and I'm quite concerned about the attitudes I see taken by airlines, particularly their advertising. I see airlines offering to fly people all over the place starting in July. The EU may have wanted reciprocal travel agreements but Canada has extended its ban on most foreign travellers until at least July 31st. New Zealand is also on the EU list of safe countries, but it says it's not prepared to risk exporting or importing cases for the sake of a holiday. I do think it is dangerous to suggest that we open up our borders at this point in time. This pandemic globally is growing. Crystal Gamancing, Global News, London. Airlines are among the industry's hardest hit by the pandemic and they're anxious to start packing planes with passengers again. Starting tomorrow, Air Canada and WestJet will no longer keep the middle seats open to allow for physical distancing on board. The airlines say the decision is based on recommendations from the International Air Transport Association, but a Canadian passenger rights advocate says airlines should instead be listening to the advice of public health experts who say it's too soon. The airlines are trying to make more profit. They seem to be getting more demand, so they think that they can now do something with those middle seats. But in practice, they seem to be playing Russian roulette with passengers' lives. British Columbia's health minister, too, is questioning the move. He wants federal officials to provide evidence that relaxing physical distancing on flights is safe. What I'd like to hear from Health Canada is, do they agree with this? because it is absolutely within their jurisdiction to deal with. So if what they're saying is what, what Air Canada and WestJet is doing is acceptable to them, they need to be explicit and they need to explain why it is. And uh, that's what we'll be waiting to hear. 
Earlier this year, Transport Canada recommended that airlines provide physical distancing on planes when possible. The agency, though, did not make it mandatory. There are more signs how much the collapse in travel is affecting Air Canada. After laying off 20,000 employees, the company now says it's suspending service on 30 domestic routes indefinitely. Most are in Ontario, Quebec and Atlantic Canada. The company also says it's shutting down operations at eight regional airports. Air Canada reported a net loss of more than a billion dollars in the first quarter of 2020 because of the pandemic. If you do fly, most airlines require you wear a mask on board. Transport Canada has made it mandatory at airports and on planes where you can't keep physically distant from other people. The advice about mask wearing, though, has shifted through the course of this pandemic. The consensus now is wearing a non-medical mask in public can help reduce the spread of the new coronavirus. And the debate now is more about whether to encourage mask wearing or make it mandatory. Mike Drolet explains. Toronto's mayor arrived with a prop, a mask, taking it off to announce Torontonians should be putting them on. We're going to rely largely on education and public awareness. Council voted to make masks mandatory for indoor public settings and businesses starting next week across the greater Toronto area, which would coincide with the start of a similar mandate for transit riders across Ontario. John Tory's bylaw comes after Premier Doug Ford dismissed the idea of a province-wide mask rule, saying it's unenforceable. Wear a mask. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's critical that you do that. But the police 14 and a half million people would be very, very difficult. It won't be any easier in Toronto, where Tory hopes people simply do the right thing. There won't really be a, an aggressive enforcement to be candid about it. In Quebec, transit riders who refuse to wear masks won't be fined. But beginning July 27th, they'll be denied entry. Yeah, the rule will be that uh, the only consequence will be that uh, you cannot use the transport. There's no fine. The mask rule has worked at reducing COVID cases in other locales, particularly New York City and Italy. We know that when people are outside, the risk of transmission is very much reduced unless there's a lot of people in a close uh, proximity to each other. But indoors, the risk of transmission is much higher, and especially in a situation where uh, physical distancing is not as easy. In British Columbia, where case numbers have been quite low, the provincial health officer recommends masks but will not make it mandatory. And over the last three weeks, there has been one day where the number of daily cases across all of Canada rose over 400. Anti-maskers will no doubt seize on that fact. Well, you gotta wear a mask, bro. Which could lead to confrontations like this. Will Torontonians comply, or will the health versus freedom debate ignite north of the border as well? Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. I can't make an accurate prediction, but it is going to be very disturbing. I will guarantee you that because when you have an outbreak in one part of the country, even though in other parts of the country they're doing well, they are vulnerable. That's America's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, testifying today about how bad things could get in the U.S. The numbers are surging so fast, experts aren't even giving a revised estimate on how many people might die. Cases are on the rise in more than half of all states. ICUs are filling up. And as Jackson Prosco reports, the country is divided over what to do. Removing any doubt about the grim trajectory of the pandemic, America's top disease experts warned the U.S. is no longer able to rein in the virus. Clearly, we are not in total control right now. Case numbers are surging at an incredible rate, especially in four heavily populated states. ICU beds are running short in Arizona and in Texas. Let us work! Where protesters objected to a new statewide order to reclose bars. The bars are not serving COVID and vodka. 17 states have paused or scrapped reopening as new infections soar to more than 40,000 per day across the country. I would not be surprised if we go up to 100,000 a day if this does not turn around. The majority of states are now seeing some sort of increase, risking the progress made in places like New York, the first to be hard hit. We can't just focus on those areas that are having the surge. It puts the entire country at risk. In a country already divided over how to respond, the director of the Centers for Disease Control called for universal adoption of masks, advice regularly undermined by President Trump and his supporters. It is critical that we all take the personal responsibility 
to slow the transmission of COVID-19 and embrace the universal use of face coverings. And in a preview of the election to come, Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden called out what he says is a failure of leadership at a time of unprecedented national crisis. We need a president, Mr. President, a president who will level with the American people. The president will tell us the unvarnished truth. Even optimism about a vaccine is beginning to wane amongst the experts over fears that too many Americans will refuse one if it is successfully developed. That would prevent this country from achieving herd immunity, allowing the virus to continue its widespread. Donna? Jackson Prosco in Washington, thank you. There's revealing new data about so-called silent spreaders, people who have an active case of COVID-19 but have no symptoms. It's based on a small town where the first COVID-19 death was recorded in Italy and which successfully suppressed its spread. The research, published in the journal Nature, is from the town of Vaux, population 3200, where a man died of COVID-19 on February 21st. The town immediately went into a two-week lockdown and nearly every resident was tested and then quarantined if their results were positive. Deeper analysis found more than 40% of people who tested positive showed no signs of sickness. Researchers also found asymptomatic carriers had a similar viral load to those who did have symptoms, suggesting so-called silent spreaders can significantly contribute to the spread of the disease. The study's authors argue widespread testing, isolating all infected people, not just those with symptoms, and a community lockdown effectively stopped the outbreak in its tracks. A strain of swine flu in China is generating lots of scary headlines. A little later in the newscast, we'll go beyond those headlines and explain what the experts are looking at. More and more companies are boycotting Facebook. Ford, Coca-Cola and Starbucks are among the latest big brands to pull paid ads from Facebook, though only for the month of July. Some Canadian companies have also joined what's called the Stop Hate for Profit campaign. They say the social media giant isn't doing enough to keep hateful and misleading content off its platform. Facebook does have massive reach and political parties and the federal government rely on it too. Our chief political correspondent David Aiken has been looking into whether they have any plans to join the Facebook boycott. David? Yeah, well, unlike uh, corporations, political parties, advocacy groups, they find social media and Facebook in particular to be an absolutely indispensable tool when it comes to uh, motivating partisans, uh, raising money and finding volunteers. And data supplied by Facebook itself shows how active Canada's major political organizations are on the platform. The Liberals spent $2.3 million on Facebook ads in the last year. The Conservatives spent $1.6 million. And the NDP spent $463,000. All but the NDP are running ads right now on the platform. Indeed, for most political contests these days, from a local nomination race to the current Conservative Party leadership fight, the campaigning takes place almost exclusively on social media. And Facebook says it is responding to criticism. In a statement to Global News, a spokesperson noted that it did ban former Toronto mayoral candidate Faith Goldie and others from its platform for violating hate speech policies. And this week, Facebook said it would subject itself to a civil rights audit. Now, as vital as these online tools are for politicians, MPs have not been afraid to criticize these platforms. In fact, MPs from all parties have been pressing social media platforms and Facebook to do more to fight hate speech. Donna? David, what about the federal government itself? It's a major advertiser in social media networks. Is it reviewing its policy? Well, it is a major advertiser. The federal government spends about $5.5 million a year on Facebook. But let's put this in perspective. Facebook earns $70 billion a year from advertisers around the world. So that's really not much when you look at what the federal government spends. Uh, we asked the prime minister's office if the federal government was prepared to join this boycott. Uh, they did not respond to our questions. But we can tell you there is no advertising review underway right now. Donna? All right. David Aiken in Ottawa. Thanks. In New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio is reallocating $1 billion from that city's police department to summer youth programming, social services and public housing. Critics say the changes could put public safety at risk. Others say it's about time and that more money needs to be shifted away from police to social services. 
Carl Reiner left a big imprint on our popular culture. If Rob knew that I was here, he'd kill me. Good, I'll call him. Coming up, a glimpse at the comedy giant's incredible career. One of Hollywood's comedy greats, Carl Reiner, has passed away. A weak stomach, Mr. Zerga? I don't believe in weakness. It costs too much. His career spanned more than 60 years, and he was a master of his craft in front of the camera and behind it. He'll be remembered for his collaborations with Mel Brooks in the 1950s and 60s and creating what he called his favorite, The Dick Van Dyke Show. He directed the classic Steve Martin films The Jerk and All of Me, and Reiner never called it quits. He was working well into his 90s. Last year, he lent his voice to the hit movie Toy Story 4. Reiner and his late wife had three children, including actor and director Rob Reiner. Carl Reiner died at home. He was 98 years old. Still ahead, why experts say a new flu linked to pigs shouldn't make fears fly. Demonstrators in Hong Kong voiced their anger today over China's new national security law. They fear it will tighten Beijing's grip on the semi-autonomous region and lead to a greater crackdown on dissent. The law will allow Beijing to take over in a crisis, such as last year's pro-democracy protests. Some offenses will carry a punishment of life in prison. The law passed one day before the 23rd anniversary of Britain handing over control of Hong Kong back to China. Well, as if we don't have enough to be worried about now, there are scary headlines about another strain of influenza found in pigs in China. Some workers on pig farms have become infected with it, but not become sick. And there's no evidence of human-to-human -human transmission. So right now, there's not much to back up those scary headlines, as Redmond Shannon explains. The H1N1 flu pandemic in 2009 likely killed tens of thousands of people worldwide. It was nowhere near as deadly as COVID-19, partly because older people tended to be immune to it. But this newer strain of so-called swine flu is something experts are taking note of, precisely because it is new. It's not so-called an immediate threat where you're seeing infections, but it's something we need to keep our eye out on just the way we did in 2009. The Chinese researchers took samples from 30,000 pigs over seven years. They found a new G4 strain of H1N1 emerge in 2013. It can be passed from pigs to humans, but probably not between humans. About 10% of slaughterhouse workers had antibodies indicating they were exposed. Two people tested positive, one of whom died. This is something that we need to, to be aware of. We need to be looking for them, but people shouldn't be freaking out. People shouldn't be worried about pigs. Professor Scott Wees says experts will be tracking how the strain evolves. So right now, if you've got something that doesn't spread well person to person, it's, it doesn't have as big a population relevance. But if this virus can change by itself or get together with another virus, then we've got more concerns. If the virus does start spreading between humans, developing a vaccine should be relatively easy, down to decades of worldwide experience in tackling the flu. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Singing through Reckoning next to Calgary Choir tunes into where Canada has fallen short. On the eve of Canada Day, at a time when we're confronting some hard truths about racism, Canada's Minister of Diversity and Inclusion has a message for the country. We have been reminded that Canada is not immune to the realities of systemic racism, inequality and racial injustice. It never was. It is a part of our history. That's something many of us have been thinking about, including a choir group in Calgary. As Heather Urex west explains, they're releasing a special version of O Canada. Calgary chorister Akina has always thought of O Canada as a prayer. Instead of like talking about patriotism and, and Canada itself, it's blessing the land and thanking Creator for the land. Ka -ka 
Kina has been singing the anthem in Cree since she was 12 years old. The translation was a gift to her from an elder. Marking Canada Day in a moment of reckoning with issues of racism and reconciliation when a pandemic continues to keep us apart isn't exactly an easy thing. But it's something the team at Calgary's Rev 52 tried to face head on. We have things that we're proud of and also things that we're not proud of. And it's really important, especially right now, to, to consider those things um, and to move forward in a positive way. It's why the group chose to open the anthem with a prelude and a poem by Richard Harrison. But times when we were glorious and times of things no one should have done. Our anthem understands words of pride with notes of mourning. We are not that diverse a group, um, and uh, not by choice, of course, um, but we looked at ourselves and thought, okay, well, how can we reach out to engage artists, Indigenous artists, people of colour? And so, Calgary R&B singer Justine Tyrell was asked to take part. I know for myself growing up, when I didn't see myself represented in a lot of things, I think it's it's consciously disheartening, but it's also subconsciously disheartening. But after seeing swells of support at marches against racism across the country, Tyrell says she feels a renewed sense of hope. Thinking about Canada Day, I get excited for the future because I see this generation and this time just really owning like what Canada could be. Giving the familiar words of O oh Canada new meaning for the road ahead. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. And that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. We leave you tonight with a salute to Alberta's new Lieutenant Governor. Her name is Selma Lakani. She's an immigrant and the first Muslim person to serve as Lieutenant Governor anywhere in Canada. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.